Hello, this is Aurel from Valor again uh, in part two of our series about the EC35. Uh, I hope you've already watched part one about setting up the EC35 to about this stage. And then in this second part, we're going to talk about taking it from this kind of assembled stage um, and then talking a little bit about settings and then yeah, using it to scan the film itself. Then in part three, we're going to talk about converting film taking them from a raw file that we take out of the camera into the computer and then creating a final positive image. So let's first talk about brief, briefly about um, camera settings. There's a few things you want to know. Uh, a lot of them are already mentioned in the manual and also on our website, uh, valoi.co. But just to briefly go over some of the main points. Um, firstly, you want to shoot in RAW format. If you don't know what that is, um, it just means that the camera records and saves as much information as possible from the sensor, as opposed to a JPEG format, which is a compressed format where the sensor um, gives the camera a bunch of inform information that the camera processes and then throws away the information that it doesn't need anymore. We want to retain as much information as possible because we're going to do a bunch of things to the files afterwards um, where we need that extra information. The next thing you want to think about is the ISO. Most cameras um, have an ISO, base ISO of 100, and this is where we want to shoot. Um, base ISO is just the, the lowest or the, the native ISO of uh, the sensor. It will vary. Some, some sensors have uh, a base ISO 160, and some even have it lower than 100. Um, do note that there are some uh, cameras that have a push ISO, uh, push, uh, sorry, a pull ISO. Um, usually, for example, in the Sony menus, it has a little line underneath the ISO indicating that it's, uh, it's different from the uh, native ISO and then the, uh, the push ISOs, which is the higher ISOs. Um, regardless, you should be on the native ISO. If you can't figure out what that is, please do Google it. It's quite important for the final result of your pictures. Um, then we're going to talk about the other two components that create the exposure of the camera, uh, the aperture and the shutter speed. So firstly, the aperture. On this lens, it's very easy. You have an aperture ring. On some more modern lenses and more modern cameras, you have to use the camera to change the aperture. Um, but you want to put your aperture around two stops, two to three stops, uh, below the most open aperture, which is the the smallest number. So this is a 2.8 lens and I would typically scan film uh, between 5.6 and f8 on this um, particular lens. Probably in between. Uh, you can test the different apertures, see if you see a difference between 5.6 and f8 um, and, and find out what's best for you. You can also ask around or, or google it. Um, a lot of people will have already talked about the lens that you have and probably it's quite scientifically tested for the best aperture. Generally, we rec recommend going on the slightly more stopped downside, just because there can be uh, a little bit of unflatness on the film and, and having a smaller aperture, bigger number, so f8, for example, allows you to um, get a little bit more depth of field that captures the negative uh, more sharply across the field. Uh, we don't recommend going beyond f8 or uh, definitely not f down to f16. This is because uh, a phenomenon called diffraction sets in. Essentially, it just makes the whole picture less sharp than it uh, ideally could be. Finally, it's the shutter speed. So because we've already set the ISO and we've set the aperture to, to those optimal qualities, we have to use the shutter speed to vary the exposure that uh, you get. And we do have to think about exposure when it comes to scanning. Uh, generally, you want to aim, if you look at the meter from the camera, you want to aim for about plus one overexposure. Um, if you're using uh, aperture priority mode, which we do recommend, and especially for most beginners, you, the camera will set the shutter speed itself, but you have to dial in this plus one overexposure. Uh, that's important because you want to capture a little bit extra information uh, that lets you scan, we call, talk about it as scanning through the orange mask of uh, color ne negative film. This is a little bit different if you scan slide film, experiment with uh, what kind of setting, wo setting works best for your slide film. 
Um, generally, you'll find that with the EC35 on maximum power and kind of a standard lens, you end up somewhere between 1 30th of a second and uh, 1 1 25th of a second. So relatively fast shutter speeds. This is a powerful light source and we've designed it for scanning. Um, but it will vary a little bit on the, uh, depending on the density, the, the thickness, the darkness of your film. Um, so the final thing to think about is kind of uh, ergonomic practical things for yourself. Um, most mirrorless cameras and also some kind of modern DSLRs have uh, what's called focus peaking. Uh, this is really nice, especially if you're using a manual focus lens or you're kind of overriding um, the autofocus uh, using manual focus, which I think most people are doing at this point. Relying on autofocus for this kind of precise focusing isn't necessarily the best. You can have uh, bad experiences with that. So using manual focus, you want to enable something called, typically called focus peaking in the menu. Uh, this is just where the camera detects contrast and it... Um, lights up with uh, a color typically red or blue a, a striking color in those areas where it sees sharp contrast and it visually displays that on the screen this is very uh, common on mirrorless cameras but yeah the modern dslrs don't uh, do have that if you don't have that or in addition to that you can uh, you should also enable uh, focus magnification uh, most mirrorless cameras these days have somewhere between 10 and 20 times magnification just on the screen a lot of touch screen enabled cameras you can just tap on the screen and it will enable this uh, if not you do have to go digging through the settings i've bound it to a key just like on the front of the camera and that makes it really convenient just click the button on the front of the camera and it zooms in very very far and then i can fo dial in the final focus with uh, with that magnification in uh, older cameras might not have this, but it's been around for over 10 years, so uh, more likely than not, your camera will have this. So, talking about focusing, uh, you should already have set up your um, setup, but you will find that uh, you can fine tune, as you start fine tuning your focus, you'll also find that you want to fine tune the, the tubes. Um, and that's why we included these shorter tubes. There's the 10 and also the 20 millimeter uh, distance tube that allows this kind of fine tuning in terms of framing. So what I'm talking about is that your, I'll demonstrate for you. So you can um, do, to, uh, your, <laughs> your uh, sensor should see ideally should see 100% of the film frame. Uh, however, because it's not a stepless system, uh, you will end up ha likely having to overscan slightly or underscan slightly. What I'm talking about here is that either you underscan and you, you crop in just a little bit, uh, because the tubes aren't stepless, you, you have to go a little bit past to, uh, to get all of the frame in the sensor, or you have to overscan a little bit which means that you include a little bit of border, like I've done here, you'll see later, that we've included a little bit of border just to uh, ensure that we have all of the film in there. You can decide what's best. Generally, it's not a big deal to crop in a little bit. You lose a few percent of resolution and that doesn't really matter. Equally, do be aware that a lot of labs uh, under scan quite significantly, sometimes even 10, 15%, making you lose a lot of the frame and if you if you underscan by five percent no one will notice um, most people frame and most even most most viewfinders on film cameras were designed to give a little bit of extra room around the negative on the negative so you won't notice this too much uh, but choose which direction you want to go in and as you start dialing in the the focus um, to be exactly uh, what you're going to scan on you might find that it changes and that's fine. This only happens once, the setup process, and then you'll just focus and be there. Maybe if it takes five minutes this time, you'll save time and frustration later. So um, the other thing we should talk a little bit about is uh, this framing when it comes to um, position, uh, frame position in the vertical direction. So. The EZ35 uh, attaches to these very solid aluminium tubes and they're very, they're very solidly machined, they don't bend at all. Uh, however, some lenses have, and you can just about see this a little bit on this lens, you, some lenses 
we'll try and give you a macro shot of this. Some lenses um, bend, bend. They have a little bit of play in the mechanism. This is fine for a lens. You don't notice it even on a macro lens. It's, it's not a big deal. We're talking about fractions of a millimeter. But you will see that, especially on longer lenses, if you have this kind of play, you can see the frame on the screen moving a little bit. And that's, that's fine. I mean, again, most labs crop in, you can do the same. Uh, if you're very frustrated by this, you, you can experiment with different orientations. So generally, I prefer to scan like this. So I have the screen towards me and the unit is just lying flat. Uh, some people will like to scan more like this, where they, um, so this is a nice flippy screen, so I can, I can point it towards me, where, where they have the camera on top and the unit on the bottom. Uh, this can help center the framing, but be aware that lenses like this one, you can see it by just putting a little bit of pressure on it, it sags. This is not made for this purpose, and you can see it just doing it by itself. We don't recommend this unless you have a very solid lens or you have an internal focusing lens like this lens. Um, this is a, got a modern Nikon DSLR lens and it doesn't move in the same way in front of the lens as like this and the Sigma does. That can be quite sturdy and in those cases you might get away with holding it like this. We primarily don't recommend putting it on a tripod because you then get the opposite problem. Okay, now you don't get the problem of it bending this way, but you get the opposite, it bends this way. Um, kind of like a elephant's trunk. That's not good, and it's very hard to counteract. Um, so if, you, if you're bothered by this um, lens bending a little bit, you can prop it up from the bottom. You can, I mean, here I have a little holder. If I just put it underneath, that will, uh, stabilize the whole setup a little bit and uh, remove this effect. It looks a little bit janky. Maybe you can think of something cleverer than this. Try, try experimenting with it and um, getting it to where you want it to be. So, now that we've talked about all of the setup and all of the settings, let's scan some film. Um, we recommend using gloves, which I'll get now. Okay, gloves. We recommend using gloves. Um, when you're touching film, it's a very sensitive material, both because you leave oils on the film, that has a negative long-term effect, but also in the short term, you don't want to leave dust or oils that will be visible in the scan. They will show up. It's a very small medium, so any anything very small will show up when you enlarge it up to a print. Um, so, to start scanning your film, have all, all your settings ready you will find that the entrance and exit lift look different. The entrance but has this um, cutout for your fingers, for the slide holder and also to extract the holders, but uh, it also has a larger opening for putting film in. So you want to find the exit. It's on the right side if you're reading the text from this orientation here, uh, and you have the rotation knob, knob on top. So from there, we can just insert film and I'm looking at the screen here on the back to insert film. There we go. Uh, I have not focused it. I'm just opening up the lens so we can focus more clearly. And then I'm stopping it down to what we call the working aperture. Now we have everything in order, just finally tuning the rotation and we're ready to scan. There's not much more to the scanning process itself. Um, what you do want to think about is how you trigger the camera. So generally with a kind of around 60 to 1, 125th of a second, you can get away with not using a remote. You can just click the shutter. However, if you do have a remote, um, we couldn't find ours. Uh, if you do have a remote, just use it. You can have it in your other hand, push the film through. and click, use your other hand, use your right hand. Um, once you've gotten through, I usually pull instead of pushing, it's easier, and take the picture. If you don't have a remote, there's not one available for your system, or you don't wanna buy one, uh, you can use a two second timer. It slows down the process a lot, and it takes away a lot of the benefit of camera scanning. Uh, try, seeing if your scans um, come out good without a remote, if you don't have one, and then use a two-second timer only as a backup option. 
yeah, as you can see, that was scanning a whole strip of film. Um, that's six pictures. You can do 36 pictures, which is one roll of, of uh, film, in about two to four minutes, depending on how quick you are with your hands. Um, so that's uh, it for scanning the film itself. We're now going to move on in the next part to converting film. So taking it from these raw files uh, into the computer, I'll show you around in a couple of different softwares and talk about converting pictures into a final positive result that you can share. Okay, I hope you join me in that part uh, and until next time, 